everybody for coming. Uh, I think I know just about everybody in the room, but for those that don't know me, I'm Beth Mead. I'm the president of the Local Impact Alliance, which is the host organization for the Community Foundations of Canton, Plymouth, and most recently West Bank, along with organizations like the Giving Hope and Giving Circle, and most recently Eagle for Children. So part of our initiative is making sure we stay connected with our community. So we decided to start this Lunch and Learn series. We're hoping it will be a monthly series. And uh, thank you to Ren Farley for coming today and starting us off. And our moderator today is going to be our vice chair, David Hammond. So thank you. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we want to uh, kind of reinvigorate. This is something that a, a decade ago, the Lunch and Learns were an important part of uh, Canton's uh, DNA, and uh, we like the idea of giving a forum for uh, people from our community talking about interesting things that impact the community. So thank you for being at the very first one. We've got a schedule that I think we passed out to everybody showing the next four, and uh, so you're welcome to come to any or all of those. And then beyond that, we're in the planning stages, so if you have an idea, somebody you'd like us to talk about, a topic you'd like us to discuss, let us know. It's as simple as that, and then we can, we can start to set it up. So it's a very informal kind of process. We're going to go about 20, 25 minutes with uh, Ren's presentation, and then it's open for questions. So any and all questions uh, are welcome. Uh, we want to encourage that. And then last but not least, as I mentioned before, we are recording this. So you can come back, and if uh, somebody missed the meeting, you can catch up later on the uh, LIA uh, website. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, Ren Farley. Uh, Dr. Farley is a research scientist at the Population Studies Center of Michigan. His research focuses upon current population trends with an emphasis on racial differences. Dr. Farley is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he served as president of the Population Association of America. He participated in the 1980, 1990, and 2000 Census Research Series, which was sponsored by the Russell Sage Foundation, and he directed the University of Michigan's Detroit Area Study three times. He's written extensively about racial and economic trends in Detroit and is currently advising the city of Detroit about the apparent 2020 census undercount. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ren Farley to our very first Lunch and Learn. That's it, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I also thank you for something different. I've been teaching at the University of Michigan since 1967, so I thank you as Michigan taxpayers for paying my salary for all those years. Technically, I retired in 2004, but I don't think my wife knows that yet. Uh, I'm a demographer. I continue to teach one uh, short course at the Ford School about uh, the Detroit area, the history and future of the Detroit area. The uh, census really is very important, constitutionally mandated. I'm going to be done in 25 minutes at most, and we'll have some discussion. The census was taken in the year 2020, uh, so the couple of years after the census are very important ones for demographers. The census does shift power and does shift money. Uh, power, of course, the number of seats in Congress and the Electoral College, but the federal government now disperses about $1.5 trillion dollars every year to states and municipalities on the basis of numbers that are linked to the census. Very few funds are distributed on a per capita basis, although Michigan has some per capita revenue sharing, but uh, the census undercount or overcount could benefit or harm a municipality or state. So there are some important things about the census. Now, census 2020, uh, reveals that Michigan is a slow-growing state. And uh, you have to think, is this something of concern or is it not of concern? <clears throat> Perhaps there are some environmentalists who would say if our population goes down, the uh, state will put less demands on resources, there will be less pollution. On the other hand, our economic system in the United States ordinarily ties population growth to economic growth. In an economically successful place, population growth is a stimulus for more economic activity, and our uh, system, both of government and the various industries, are not really cope, uh, familiar with adjusting to population stagnation and decline. We find it very hard to close schools and to close universities, but that's going to inevitably happen if the population continues to decline. 
to compare Michigan to other states, what I've done in a number of these figures is to take the fastest growing states. This is uh, the fastest growing in population between 2010 and 2020. 2020 and the western states on uh, the Rocky Mountain states grew very rapidly. You see the Big Ten states down there are um, the Big Ten states. Michigan is not among the fastest growing of the Big Ten states. And I'm, oh, I, yeah, it's okay. And Michigan grew by a very small amount, and there were only four states that grew less rapidly than Michigan. Connecticut, and then Illinois, Mississippi, and West Virginia lost population between the last two censuses. Uh, what are we doing wrong here? Okay, the next one, uh, Michigan has this recent history of slow population growth. At our peak back in 1970, Michigan accounted for more than 4% of the nation's population. We're now down to about 3% of the population. And Michigan's clout in the Congress and the Electoral College has gone down since uh, 1980. After each census, we have lost one seat in Washington. Uh, so there is this change. I mentioned that Michigan is now a relatively low fertility state. As you're aware, we've had something of a second demographic transition in the United States in the last uh, 30 years. That is, in the post-World War II period, almost all young people got married shortly after high school or after college. And uh, at the peak of fertility rates in the United States, a typical woman create, it, completed her fertility with about 3.3 children. And that's no longer the case. Marriage is being delayed and birth rates have gone down. Uh, and this means much lower fertility in uh, the United States now. And the high fertility states are those Midwestern rural states where they have fertility rates that are still below replacement level. Replacement level would require women to bear an average of about 2.1 children in their lifetime. No state has that uh, attainment, has uh, that kind of fertility rate. And Michigan is below the national average. So we are seeing a very sharp change in how people spend their adult lives. In 1970, 78% of the women in more Michigan, aged 25 to 29, were married living with a spouse. That's down to 28% now. In 1970, it was 71% of the men, 25 to 29, were married living with a spouse. That's down to 19% now. So there is this fundamental change, and the United States is going to get into the position of being a very slow-growing country. We can welcome immigrants, uh, and that may continue our population growth, but there has been a major change in the lifestyles of adults and how they, uh, how they live their lives. Uh, I mention also that Michigan has a situation in which uh, we do not have as low mortality rates as many other states. We have had the very unfortunate circumstance since about 2016 of seeing death rates go up in the United States from opioids and more recently from suicides, from alcohol abuse, and from homicide, unfortunately. We hope this is a temporary phenomenon, but when we look around the states in the Union, we see that the lifespan in Michigan is about three years shorter than it is in California and Hawaii. Fortunately, we're about four years longer in lifespan than in uh, Mississippi and uh, West Virginia, but Michigan is no longer a low death rate state. And if we look around the state of Michigan and we think, are there counties where there's rapid population increase? And there are only a few counties, only seven counties in Michigan grew as rapidly in the last decade as the entire United States. Those counties around Grand Rapids, the uh, Traverse Bay area, and Washtenaw County. So population decline is pretty common in Michigan with a number of uh, counties, including the uh, metropolitan area around Wayne County, having slow population growth. And we are in Michigan also experiencing something new. We are now, as of 19, 20, 21, a natural decrease state. That means more deaths than births. This is the result of aging of the population, not many young people moving in here, and fertility rates going down. And that blue line shows the surplus of births over deaths. Back in 2010, that was about 25,000. 
and last year there were about 11,000 more deaths than births, and we show, I show in the bottom orange line there, net domestic uh, migration, the exchange of population with other states, the Census Bureau estimates that every year. We typically have been losing on the order of 45,000 or 40,000 or so people on that exchange. That has tapered off in the pandemic, and all the economic and population trends for the last two or three years are affected by the pandemic, and who knows what's going to happen in the future. But there is a shift in what kinds of services people need, what kinds of businesses and employment will prosper when the population ages, and that's different from when the population is growing rapidly. And I show a map here showing natural decrease counties in blue, namely most of Michigan, most of the 83 counties are in the situation now of having more deaths than births, reflecting the old age of the county's populations. Moving on to racial ethnic change in Michigan, there are some things worth uh, reporting about that. I have a picture here of the racial ethnic composition of Michigan in 2010 and 2020. The large red is the percentage of people who are non-Hispanic whites, and I mentioned that the Office of Management and Budget insists that on all federal forms we, first of all, identify ourselves as Hispanic or not Hispanic, and then we go on to identify ourselves by race. And since 2000, we've been able to identify with as many races as we want. So we can identify with as many as five different races. And what the, uh, has been happening is particularly between uh, 2010 and 2020, we've had a sharp increase in the number of people who identify with two races. So in Michigan, the share of population who are white and the share of population who are black has decreased a little bit. The Asian population has grown rapidly. The Hispanic population has grown rapidly. But most surprisingly, perhaps, is the two-race population. And I show here the rates of increase by these racial ethnic groups from 2010 to 2020 in Michigan and in the entire United States, shown in blue. And you can see the very surprising thing is that the Hispanic, non-Hispanic two-race population has been just growing very, very rapidly. We are seeing a lot more interracial marriages. We now around the country are in a situation in which about 8% of the people who say they are African American also say they are white, and about 2% of the people who say they're white say they are also African American. Now, there's a demographer who's written a recently famous book arguing that this is a very hopeful sign and that in two or three generations into the future, we will have a population in which most people or many people have ancestors from two or more different racial groups and the racial divisions that have uh, divided our society for so long may wane and decrease just as after World War II, the ethnic groups and the religious groups that moved to the suburbs started to intermarry and the ethnic rivalries and hostilities that once characterized cities waned away and are less significant than they were in the past. That's an optimistic view and many people would challenge it, but that may happen. Michigan's economic trends, uh, there are some things. I don't want to be particularly negative on it. I think I can end on a more optimistic uh, tone, uh, but the Census Bureau gathers a lot of data about what industries are growing and declining. And Michigan is, uh, has a situation in which we may not have an industrial structure that's particularly conducive to future growth. This shows the increase or increase in employment and health and education is one of the most rapidly growing sectors of the economy, partially because of the aging of the population, and growth in Michigan has been below that of the rest of, of the nation. And manufacturing is what is still distinctive in Michigan. We have about twice as high a proportion of workers in manufacturing as uh, the nation. And if you look at change in industrial employment from 2020 to 2022, the 2020, the 20 year period, uh, you see that Michigan is not growing in its industrial structure at the rate of uh, employment at the rate of the rest of the nation. Health and education increased in 20 years by 40% nationally, only 15% in Michigan, and even manufacturing employment has decreased more in Michigan than it has nationally. Uh, per capita income is another indicator that we may or may not often think about, and Michigan used to have a very high per capita income when the automobile plants uh, were 
providing a lot of high paying blue collar jobs back in the 1950s and 60s, now per capita income in Michigan is toward the bottom of the blue collar states. It's certainly ahead of the least prosperous states, but Michigan is in the lower half of the states with regard to per capita income. And uh, if you look at change in per capita income, and I see I got an orange bar instead of a red bar up there, this is the change in per capita income in constant dollars in the last 20 years. And Michigan uh, is one of the, Michigan and Nevada are the only two states in which per capita income has actually gone down in the last 20 years. I'm not going to be totally pessimistic about what's happening, but uh, it is a case that if we're thinking about planning in Michigan, and we've got, what, 13, 14 people running for governor, there are some questions to be asked about how are we going to uh, sustain economic growth in the state. And if you look at percent of people 25 to 29 with a uh, college degree, Michigan is below average. Uh, we are quite far below the uh, New England states and the East Coast states with regard to graduates of college when they get to be 25 to 29. And as some of you are aware, we've seen a dramatic, well, dramatic may be the wrong word, but we've seen a substantial change. Women are completing college much more frequently than men are now. Here in uh, Michigan, about 45% of the women, 25 to 29, have completed four years of college. For men, it's about 38%. And this is a trend that has increased in recent years. So those are some of the things about the state and how it's changing. And let me just say a few things about population trends in the Detroit metropolitan area. I have maps here which are not the world's most attractive maps. Traditionally, we thought of a three county metropolitan area, and most of my numbers refer to a three county metropolitan area, but the Census Bureau then changed it, it's really Office of Management and Budget, to define a six county metropolitan area. If you look at the largest metropolitan areas counted in the last census, you see that Detroit is about 16 out of the top 20 metropolitan areas with a population of 4.4 million, which makes it still a very large metropolitan area. And if you look at the growth rate of metropolitan areas of the top 20 metropolitan areas, uh, Detroit is second to Chicago from the bottom. We have had growth here, but it's only about 2% in this metropolitan area. Nationally, the population grew by about 7%. And I have a chart here showing the population of the metropolitan area in blue, and the metropolitan area reached its peak pop about 1970 and has been more or less stable since then. The suburban ring is in gray, and the suburban ring population hasn't grown very much since 1970, and the city's population continues to decline. There has been one major shift in this metropolitan area, and that is the suburbanization of the African-American population. The white population moved out of Detroit starting in the 1950s, and there was a major movement of, African, of whites from the city to the suburbs, and African-Americans, after about 1990, started moving out to the suburbs, presumably for many of the same reasons. Uh, taxes were lower, crime rates were lower, schools were scoring higher, on various standard tests, and this uh, racial attitudes changed such that, there was, such that there was less hostility to African Americans moving into the suburb and suburbs, and by uh, 2020, the African American population was almost evenly split between living in the city of Detroit and living throughout the suburban ring, and I uh, have written about this. It's not that there's sort of total integration, but for the most part, in the suburban ring, uh, this has been uh, a change that has not produced uh, confrontations. And if you look at the suburban ring, there are some places where there are concentrations of African American population, but there are many areas where there are small numbers. So it's a kind of achievement because we do remember the days of Orville Hubbard uh, strongly opposing integration of the suburbs to a situation in which there is a substantial minority population in the uh, suburbs of Detroit. I have a chart here showing the 20 largest suburbs of Detroit, 
And you can see that Canton Township and Westland are among the larger suburbs of the city of Detroit at this time. Got a few more things to say about that. And this is information about the growth rate of the largest suburbs of Detroit and the city of Detroit. And you can see that here in Canton Township, there was a healthy growth of more than 9%. The metropolitan area grew by only 2%, and the national population grew by 7%. Uh, in the suburban ring, it was a 5% increase. In Westland, there was an increase, it was only about 2%. And then the city of Detroit is the major place losing population. If I had all the suburbs here, some of the older industrial suburbs have lost population at rates approaching that of the loss rate in the city of Detroit. And as following up on the racial ethnic situation in the city of Detroit, there has been a change. The percentage of population African American in the last decade went down from about 83% to about 77%. The growth has been a growth of the uh, two race population, a growth of the Hispanic population, and a growth of the white population in Detroit. Actually, the white population of the city of Detroit grew more rapidly than the white population of the entire uh, situ of the entire. Uh, nation. And if you look at the suburbs, there is a somewhat similar and somewhat different pattern. The proportion of population white has gone down from about 78% to 70% in the suburbs. There has been some growth, modest growth, of the African American population as a percent of the total population, but there's been a rapid growth of the Hispanic population and the Asian population in the suburbs, and a rapid growth of the two-race population in the suburbs. So the suburbs are changing, but are still predominantly uh, white. And this shows the population change in the uh, uh, city and the suburbs for this period and the uh, two race population growing very rapidly in the city, in the suburbs, the Asian population growing rapidly in the suburbs, the Hispanic population growing rapidly in the suburbs, whereas the black population going down in the city and going up in the suburbs. There's been a loss over the years, 20 years, of about 250,000 African Americans from the city and almost a parallel growth in the suburban uh, ring. Let me have just make conclude with a few comments about Canton Township and uh, Canton Township and Westland. Oh, this this is a, the, the the population change as the census reveals, and uh, Westland has had a pretty stable population since 1970, shortly after it was formed, about 86,000. There hasn't been much population increase or decrease. On the other hand, Westland has grown very rapidly, was an outlying suburb that in 1970 was just beginning to move, to boom, and there's certainly a lot of vacant land in Westland. There's every reason to think there will be some continued increase of the population in Westland. Uh, I show the racial composition of the two places, predominantly white. The difference is that Canton Township has a uniquely, well, has a somewhat high representation of Asians in this area. And Westland, perhaps because of its proximity to, uh, to Inkster, has a higher than usual, higher than normal for the suburbs, representation of African Americans in uh, the city of Westland. Household income for these places, Canton Township, among the 20 largest suburbs, ranks fairly high in income. Uh, Westland has a median household income below the metropolitan Detroit area, but very, very far below, above a Detroit and Pontiac. Median value of owner-occupied homes, pretty high in Canton Township, considerably higher than in metropolitan Detroit, Westland, somewhat below the metropolitan average, but still uh, a fairly substantial value for uh, median value for owner-occupied homes. I uh, mention here millage rates because millage rates in the Detroit area vary from quite low until extremely high. I don't have the places that have the highest millage rates. Unfortunately, it's often the lower income communities that have the highest millage rates. Here's Detroit with a millage rate of about 80 mills, 
Westland has a higher millage rate, Canton Township a pretty low millage rate. Uh, there's a long story to be told here, but maybe the state government will look into these issues sometime. And I have the figure here. If you paid $250,000 now for a home in, what have I got up there? Okay, if you paid $250,000 for a home in uh, the suburbs of Detroit, particularly starting with, well, Detroit, you'd pay about $8,000 a year in uh, taxes, and if you were in Canton Township, you would pay considerably less in taxes, and so there is some uh, discrepancy between millage rates and the services that you get, I think. So those are my comments about what is going on. I think, though, there is some reason to be optimistic. Detroit is the, still the center of the world's automobile industry. The automobile industry is going through this dynamic change, and it's occurring in Detroit and in the suburbs. GM invested more than $2 billion in their new, what they call Plant Zero, the old Hamtramck Detroit Assembly. Stellantis spent more than $3.3 billion to build a new uh, plant for their Jeep 3 Bench Cherokee and an engine plant on the east side of Detroit. Uh, Ford is investing upwards of a billion dollars in the old railroad station and is cooperating with Google to have a technological center there. And in the suburban ring, uh, the new truck companies are well represented here. Rivian's got an operation in Plymouth. Uh, Maharindi is once again producing their off-road vehicles in Auburn Hills. Uh, any of the, several of the old Bollinger truck company is represented here. Hyundai has a research place here. Tata had a large, had a research operation in the suburbs and then moved their operation into the city of Detroit. And uh, just this week, Stellantis announced that in cooperation with the Ontario government, they're going to build a $4 billion dollar uh, factory to produce batteries in uh, Ontario, Windsor, Ontario, and GM has got this agreement to spend about $7 billion for new plants in the state of Michigan. There is, of course, competition for this, and Tennessee has done well in attracting plants, it looks like, but I think there is reason to believe that the spin-offs from the automobile industry, and even though there will be less labor going into, into assembling uh, electric vehicles, you still need dozens and hundreds of parts suppliers which are gonna be located in Detroit and in the suburbs of Detroit. So I don't think there's any reason to be overly bleak about what is happening, but there still is competition for investment, and uh, we have seen the emergence, which totally surprised me, of the metropolitan area becoming something of a financial center. United Wholesale Mortgage in Pontiac is the second largest mortgage originator in the country. Quicken Loans in Detroit is the largest mortgage originator. Alley Financial, which isn't very visible, it's the old GMAC, they are now the fourth largest bank holding company in the country, and they want to get into online banking. And then Huntington Bank uh, is building a 25-story building right across from Comerica Park in Detroit. And when Huntington Camp when Huntington Bank came here, they announced that in the next six or seven years, they had $40 billion to loan to sponsor economic development in southeast Michigan, $24 billion for housing issues, and they had, uh, I think it's $8 billion for small businesses, and they reserved $2 billion of that for small minority businesses. So the Detroit area, kind of unexpected to me, is on the verge of becoming something of a larger financial center, which will benefit, I think, the state of Michigan. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> we'll open it up for questions. Before we do that, I just wanted to ask you about one sure. thing. We're hearing a lot about the undercount and the potential undercount in Detroit, and I wondered, uh, with a lot of the migration that we're seeing to the suburbs, do we feel like there might have been an undercount here as well? If you could talk a little bit about that, please. Uh, yes, I have uh, worked on a group at the University of Michigan that has been advising Detroit. The census was taken in the pandemic, which was a difficult time, and the Census Bureau does evaluate their own work, and their own work suggests they did a worse census here than 10 years ago. The uh, Latino undercount, the Census Bureau suggests, was 5.5%, and the last time around it was about 2.5%. 
and the undercount of uh, African Americans, they suggest, was about 2.8 percent. The last time it was around 2.2 percent, and the overcount of whites went up a little bit. Uh, now, I, some people will say the Washington Post has a editorial arguing that this was a Trump administration decision. I'm less sure about that, and I will, I'm not apologizing, but I did work for the Census Bureau in this last census. I think eight times I've worked for the Census Bureau. Uh, but there was a question, I think, of allocating resources in that short period when people who did not respond to the census were supposed to be contacted. I was doing enumeration out in Ann Arbor. I would have been happy to come any place here to do a little more enumeration. They didn't ask me, but some of my colleagues who were enumerating in Ann Arbor were offered the chance to go to Ohio, Indiana, and North Carolina to do enumeration. But uh, undercount is a serious issue. 10% of what we pay in sales tax in Michigan is returned to cities on the basis of their pop size. So if you miss 10,000 people, that's a fair amount of money for the city government. So it's an issue. The Census Bureau keeps saying that they will try to take these errors into account when they make population estimates. And the population estimates that they produce annually are used for dispersing most federal funds, but I don't think they're used for dispersing state funds. So there is an issue, and there will probably be lawsuits about it. I don't know. Thank, go ahead. I tell you what, just so we can record it, if you don't mind, can you come up and speak into the mic with your questions? That would be great. Uh, it's right up here on the corner. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little bit cumbersome. Yeah. Thank you. I was just wondering, so what you were just speaking of, so there is a tool supposedly, we had difficulty as a township. There was a tool that you could look at and determine what neighborhoods weren't responding. Yes. And we kept trying to get a hold of that tool, but they kept saying it didn't work for a township. So we really think the township was undercounted. We had an 80% response rate, so they just basically estimated. Oh. So, uh, you know, the rest. But we think we could have, we really wanted to find out where those spots were so we could help more. So, I mean, do you have any indications on what we should do no, about I, that? No, I've used that tool. Uh, I've looked at census tracts using that tool. And you could put together the census tracts that approximate a township uh, and see what the, that, that information is still available. And they did that every day. What percent of the housing units that they thought existed are, were responding and did that every day. Now, in Detroit and in other cities, and Detroit's not the only one, there is an argument, contention, that the Census Bureau's list of address was seriously deficient. Uh, I worked a little bit on that, but I don't know. I would think that here in the suburbs, the list of addresses would be pretty solid, but having looked at some evidence on lists of addresses in Detroit, I know that the, for instance, the DTE list of addresses, the post office list, the city assessors list, they don't agree all that much, uh, but I, how would we find out? Because we still have asked for evidence of that tool showing where we were short and maybe some counts, and we, they just said it just doesn't work for the township. So where could we find out a little bit more? Uh, gee, I don't, I don't know. I don't know directly. I will ask. I'll send you, if you'll drop your card or name off, I'll send you a message about that, though. Okay. But I think there's, you know, undercount. Is, is not a, it's a serious problem. And we do have overcount in the census, uh, particularly people who've got a condo in Florida and a condo in Michigan. They tend to be overcounted. And in this census, people who are counted at the university may also be counted at home. Those are the two groups that are overcounted. So we'll connect you guys afterwards. Then. Sure, great. Uh, Dries, do you have a ever go back and say, hey, we, we made a mistake <laughs> and change things? I mean, you know, what, what is, you know, if they... <laughs> I don't mean to be flippant, okay. but the answer is absolutely not. Okay. In other words, the official apportionment count that's been used to redistrict, that is not going to change okay. in any regard. There have been many lawsuits about this, and uh, what the Census Bureau does is say, we're going to make good estimates, better estimates, we will incorporate those errors, we will adjust for those errors, and they, every December, release a July 1st estimate 
of the population of every municipality in the United States. And what they'll do is try to incorporate that. They have a very formal procedure for doing that. But uh, officially, the official numbers are not going to change. change. So, so the number that's determining congressional districts that will not Never change, change no. but, but as the years go by, it, you know, um, allocation of funds may change. Yes. Okay. All right. D did anybody else have a question? I, I just yes, asked. Yes, we've got time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so did, I, I don't know, you know, that much about what a demographer does. Um, I, you, obviously, you're looking at trends and, and, re, and, and interpreting and reporting them, how much you do. But my, I was kind of curious with, with people not marrying earlier in life and having fewer children, are there any thoughts about why that is happening? There are speculations about why that is happening. We had a broadening of opportunities for women during the Civil Rights Revolution. Uh, we had into the 1970s, most of the Ivy League schools did not allow women. University of North Carolina, University of Virginia were male-only schools. We changed that when Ford was president with Title IX, and women have pursued advanced educations at a higher rate than men are pursuing them. And this is a fundamental change that is evident in Western Europe, and my friends who even study the Islamic world say it's happening there too, that once the good jobs were pretty much reserved for men, and when I was in high school, they used to joke that women went to college not to get an education, but to find a husband, and that has changed drastically. And I'm somewhat surprised that Women are entering a lot of jobs that were once overwhelmingly male. Was it the last Super Bowl game? There was a woman as a referee and there was a woman as an assistant coach. And the New York Yankees have a woman as a manager of one of their minor league teams now. There is a change going on that uh, I'm not sure how you totally explain it, but it is, it is a big change. The um, implications are pretty significant. Yes, they are. Without having a you know, with a, the skew of an aging population. Yeah, yeah. But with the, no demographers ever predicted the baby boom that did occur, so I'm not sure demographers can be t trusted to predict what's going to happen <laughs> next. In the past, the Census Department produced a very good summary by community of demographics. It might have come from the community survey, mm -hmm. incomes, who's living alone in the house, when will that be available? It seems delayed, and where can we find it? In the past, they used to mail it to no. the community, the mayor, or the supervisor. I, I do not know when they will resume doing that. I presume that they will, but their community survey, the census asks only 10 questions, so questions about income, educational attainment are on the community survey. And they had trouble with that in, 19, in 1920 and 21 because of the pandemic. Their staff that would have been enumerating in that survey were tied up in the Census Bureau. They're getting back on track, but I don't know how long it will take them to do that. I presume they will continue to do this picture portrait of, of your community. Up on the, the, the question or the point regarding uh, replacement population and uh, the number of uh, children being born. Um, and, and I noticed, and I was intrigued to see that Dearborn and Dearborn Heights uh, had some of the largest oh, increases yes, yes. in population in, the, in Wayne County in the Detroit metropolitan area. And uh, it could be certainly attributed to uh, some immigration, but as we know that a great deal of the population there is uh, Asian American. Oh, yes. And I'm also wondering, uh, to your knowledge, uh, do Asian American families end, uh, have a higher birth rate than um, not Hispanic whites or other, um, other, other demographic groups? No. The Asian uh, fertility rate is not particularly high, but the Asian population is very young. We have been uh, receiving lots and lots of Asians coming to study, uh, young people coming to study, and uh, so they are young and they start their families thereafter. The very rapid rate of population growth in Dearborn and Dearborn Heights 
is the Middle Eastern population that has come in here. Uh, it was quite amazing for people to realize that Hamtramck, that had been losing population hand over fist for decades, suddenly grew by 24%. And Hamtramck has got a side of the city that's a Bengali population and another side that's a Yemeni population. There aren't too many Polish people living there anymore. So immigrants in many places are renewing the population size, uh, renewing population. The Hispanic story is a little bit different because Hispanics were concentrated in the southern states along the Mexican border in Florida and that population is now dispersing across the entire United States. And Michigan, surprisingly, had a fairly high rate of growth of the Hispanic population. So the immigrant population is replacing the populations that were here before in some important ways, significant ways. As a policy matter, or for policymakers, have you seen the communities that are seeing uh, rapid declines, uh, out migrations and, and declines, from, say, Detroit to the suburbs. Are you seeing any concerted effort by policymakers to recruit new populations that have been successful here in Michigan? I don't think so. Uh, it's difficult to do that. Uh, the city of Detroit put some emphasis on refurbishing neighborhoods, and there certainly is new construction in Detroit and in some of the suburbs. Uh, but a policy to attract population has been rarely invoked in the United States. Tulsa, Oklahoma was offering, I think, $10,000 to families that had, uh, had some kind of advanced degree or wanted to start a business. And there are some suburbs of Pittsburgh that had a lot of vacant houses, nobody paying taxes on them. And they didn't exactly give them away, but they almost gave them away and freed a newcomer from paying taxes for five years. But strategies to attract people other than the job strategy, which is what has been used in Michigan, namely, the state has invested money in attracting new firms to create jobs, and that in turn will bring population. So I don't know of, there are a few other places that have paid people to move in, that is paying them if they come and start a business or if they come with an advanced degree. So that's a possibility. All right. Hi, Professor. Thanks for coming. Um, were you surprised at all about the numbers in Detroit, um, given that in the last 10 years, maybe even longer, we felt a rebirth of Detroit as a city, and do you expect it to turn around to a more positive trend? Yes, I was, I was surprised by the low population count in Detroit. The Census Bureau every year estimates the number of housing units in the city and the number of people in the city. And the Census Bureau agreed with Detroit back in about 2017 that there were roughly 350,000 housing units in Detroit. The census counted only 309,000 housing units. And while there's abandonment and demolition in Detroit, there's no way a city could lose 40,000 housing units in a very brief period of time. And that made me instantly think there's some undercount of housing units, and that could be the case particularly if people are, uh, you know, one house is occupied by two families or other things like that. So it's, uh, that's a, a possibility. So, uh, um, and do you think that the numbers will grow in Detroit uh, or the trend shows anything to that effect? Well, I think there certainly are, cities around the United States are increasingly becoming the home of the rich and the poor. And uh, we saw a mansion in Detroit sell for $4.5 million this week, which would have been totally surprising a few years ago. So there are very nice neighborhoods in Detroit, new condos coming online. And Ford, when they went into the railroad station, said they thought they wanted talented people and that talented young people coming out of the universities often wanted a city to live in. So I think there will be some growth there. Stabilizing neighborhoods is 
underway in Detroit, but being frank about it, crime rate is high in Detroit. The schools have improved. There's real evidence of improvement, but most of the suburban schools have better statistical records of achievement, and automobile insurance stir, sure would deter you from, well, the suburbs have generally much lower automobile and homeowners insurance than the city of Detroit. City is working on that, but that progress is very slow. Thanks. for such a excellent talk on it. Thank you. Uh, two points actually stood out to me. Women, you know, trends looking that women have entered the job force, getting more stable financially, but it has its own repercussions. So population is not increasing. What do we do about it? I mean, do we don't... We about... How, how do we, in, you know, encourage women to have more children? Do we stop education for them? Do we stop them entering from workforce? I mean, how do you, where do you place all these things? How do you send, make sense out of it? We want women to come forward and move into the workforce, but is that going to affect our population replacement? It's a very good question, and there is no simple answer. Europe had very low fertility rates during the Depression. And in the European countries, particularly France, the government started, as it were, subsidizing uh, childbearing. There was a government payment per child, and uh, that didn't have a huge effect. Now, we have certain kinds of tax credits. I don't think it's going to be easy to have a government policy. Some of the costs of having children could be mitigated by more child care deductions from your income tax or other things, but I'm not sure there's a good strategy for doing this. And this is a worldwide problem. The Japanese, the Russians, the Chinese even, after they had their one-child policy and it overshot. So there is this question of low fertility and uh, I don't know of any strategy that really, there are a few isolated groups that still have high fertility, but they tend to be very small groups and in isolated areas. So we have seen a major change in how particularly many women spend their adult lives. Of course, there are still women who raise three or four children, but they are a much smaller fraction than they used to be. So there is this question, and I don't know, I personally think there are benefits to continued population growth, and yet there are many challenges in achieving it. And so far as I know, no nation has really had a policy that has been very effective in this regard. Right. I think China is, China is experiencing the same situation because yes. their population is aging. Yes. And the women over there have realized, okay, <laughs> we have come to a point where we can pursue our education, pursue our financial independence and everything, don't want to bear more than, you know, it comes yeah. with responsibility. Yeah. So is this something that the U.S. is also experiencing at this time? China experienced... Well, the birth rates have gone down in Latin America and Africa and the Middle East. There's this worldwide tendency toward lower fertility. And, uh, you know, uh, environmentalists might say this is a great thing. Yeah. But uh, there are other problems, and it's going to be very, very difficult for, you know, city planners to say, geez, we're going to plan for 3% decrease every five years. That's going to be, it's very hard to think about that. Right. How do you bring the climate change and everything come into? Oops. Pardon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you said the wrong word. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh. I think we're, we might be done then. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming to our first lunch and learn. I hope you got some uh, interesting information, things to think about, and I hope uh, we, we gave each one of you a list of upcoming speakers. I hope you can join us again. So thank, thank you, you very much. much. Your questions are right on the mark, and uh, I'm hopeful that things will work out. Michigan has a lot of assets. It's a beautiful state in many ways. Oh, I've been asked a number of times, will Michigan's population boom when the coastal areas are inundated with water. We don't have hurricanes here. We don't have many tomatoes, tomato, tornadoes. We don't have, <laughs> and we don't have uh, forest fires here. Will we be inundated by 
people who come from Florida and so forth. I don't think that's going to happen, but maybe it will. Who knows? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.